What's up, guys? Hey, Howard, good evening to you, too. What's up, what's up? We're back. Dr. Jaws here, and uh, we are celebrating a really special thing tonight. Um, so I actually uh, rechecked my uh, stream uploads uh, just to make sure, because I kind of had this funny instinctive feeling. I was like, has it really been a year? And the answer is yes, uh, it's actually been a year. Uh, so we've actually done a year of the Dr. Jaws Live shark study parties. So we've done a year's worth of sharks at this point. The first stream came out uh, November 7th of 2022, and uh, it's November 13th of 2023. So uh, we're celebrating tonight with the swell shark and a, a couple of reflections. I think, I think most of the reflections and just kind of like celebrating in the year, I want to say for the holiday special, which will be uh, in next month in December, but uh, but yeah, it's really cool. Like, officially and technically, it's been one year. So, like, woo! <laughs> um, and, like, honestly, like, pretty much uh, everybody, like, who's been here, like, you, Howard, and, like, Roy, Roy uh, especially, like, you know, have been here pretty much throughout the entirety of the year. So, I mean, just huge cheers to you guys and, you know, just to everybody else who's, like, kind of been there, you know, like, Connor and Jess, Anya, Beth, uh, my family. <laughs> like, <laughs> Like, honestly, like, it's been a lot of fun. Um, it, like, Sir Douglas Bain, a new joiner of the stream. Uh, like, like, we've had a lot of fun people, like, kind of be part of our community. And it's been growing. Like, like ever since it started, it's actually been, you know, continuing to grow. It's still a very tiny channel, but, like, I'm proud of it. I'm sincerely really proud of it. There's been a lot of cool stuff this year, so. Um, I'm really excited. I'll probably talk a little bit about just, just the year in general, but, but really, really, that a lot, that a lot of small shark, shark material, material tonight, tonight, so, so um, um, I, promise I promise I won't be too distracted, distracted with that. that. But, but cheers, cheers. Oh, and shoot, and shoot, and shoot, I apologize, but, um, I hope that, hope that kind of sorts out about it. If, let me know, let me know, it might be, it might be a music choice, uh, I'm listening to Donut Country, which I feel like is a good, good, Swell shark vibe, but, uh, yeah, yeah, if, yeah, if, 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 if let me know if, know if it, if it keeps, keeps, um, some, um like, if it's like still it's fuzzy, so fuzzy, like, like, like uh, yeah, I'll probably I'll maybe tone that down a little, little bit, but either way, cheers, uh, cheers to, uh, our community, uh, this is super cool, and also cheers to this fantastic drawing of the swell shark, so thank you, Howard, for saying this over, this is really cool, and it was funny, I was looking at, um, I'm keeping all the art uh, throughout the year, um, which probably may or may not be featured in the holiday special. So <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm so I've been so looking forward to like December. Um, but anyway, like uh, and the past couple streams, it's been all deep water sharks. It's been you know spooky, dark, like like creepy, like you know midnight zone sharks, which is appropriate for Halloween. But it's so nice to come back to the surface and uh, to be in like. You know, bright. It's not tropical technically. I mean, because swell sharks spend most of their time in temperate water, but uh, bright, colorful water, uh, bright, colorful environment. So this is super cool, and thank you so much for capturing that. So I love this piece of art because uh, it's like you have the swell shark um, and like a really good, good capture of like its um, unique patterns and spots, and then also just kind of like that common position of the tail kind of curving around or curling around the body. And you can kind of subtly see a little bit of like the belly, which is really cool because that's something uh, characteristic of this species. So uh, swell sharks get their name from their ability to swell up uh, if they feel threatened. It's kind of like a puffer fish a little bit. Um, it, it's different kind of things. Like for a swell shark, the swelling is to help them um, be either indigestible or kind of like wedged into a rocky crevice so that uh, a predator can't nudge them out of the crevice. Uh, there might be more functions for that, so um, you know we'll kind of dive into that as we get more into the science tonight. But uh, but yeah, like uh, it's it's kind of a cool uh, group of sharks. They are a kind of cat shark uh, and actually distant, very very distant cousins of more commonly known sharks like hammerheads and leopard sharks and um, like you know sandbar sharks. They're all in the same order, Carcharinoforms. Uh, it looks so different, but it's actually. A uh, carcarinoform, so uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, the key feature being that swell sharks, like all carcarinoforms, have that nictitating membrane, so they're able to protect their eyes with um, this kind of like protective um, flap. Uh, birds have this as well, um, so when they're feeding, they can cover their eyelid or their eyes 
um, to protect the eyeball. So, uh, but thank you so much, Howard, uh, Howard, for saying this over. This is super, super cool. Um, is, a, uh, is the audio better, by the way? Um, let, please let me know if the uh, audio has improved. I can check that on the stream as well. But um, how have you been, by the way? How was your weekend? And while we're catching up, we've got a lot of cool uh, clips uh, for tonight. Um, a lot of cool uh, Swell Shark videos. Um, oh, perfect. Thank you. So uh, audio is okay. Um, there's a lot of cool Swell Shark videos out there. Um, this one's from uh, Wei Wei Gao, so go ahead and subscribe to that channel. Uh, but this is in Scripps Canyon um, in, uh, I think this is off of California. Uh, it's uh, Scripps, like Scripps Institute of Oceanography. But uh, yeah, there, we've got a lot of videos. It's nice to have a shark. Um, oh, that's actually really beautiful. Um, it's nice to have a shark species that's back in shallow water and that's like got a lot of footage uh, associated with it so that we can kind of more closely take a look at like how it moves and how it behaves so this individual these are very these are already very cute um, but these individuals are tucked away in this little crevice right here they don't seem to be swelling up uh, they seem a little bit more relaxed they're just kind of like nudging around um, what's funny is like I did take a quick peek at a lot of the clips and these actually are pretty active I know the description for swell sharks typically is that they are sluggish, but I actually think these are a little bit more active than than fits. Like like when you see clips of like chain cat sharks, for example, like that species just doesn't move. Like it's always on the bottom. But these swell sharks, you know, they're just like they're kind of squirmy and uh, <laughs> like you know uh, they're itchy. <laughs> Uh, one really cool thing you can see very clearly here is buccal pumping. So uh, this swell shark, uh, let me go back to that because that was a really great clip actually. This swell shark is actively sucking in water and pumping it over its gills so that it can breathe. So it's another great species to illustrate that not like like that myth that sharks need to swim to breathe uh, breathe is a myth. Uh, for some species it's true, but for a lot of species like the swell shark, uh, they can sit on the seabed very comfortably and actively pump water over their gills. So he's opening his mouth and pumping the water through his gills and expelling it through his gills. So he's breathing, you know, even though he's just sitting on the seabed. So, um, do you want to take a look at this clip again? This is such a cool feature, by the way. Um, oh, nice. Weekend was good. Visiting old friends. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, the patternation on these sharks is very intricate. Like, like they good, good observation. They're, they're. I love cat sharks because they're all very beautiful species and they're all very different looking. And actually, cat shark is like a really great name for these sharks because, not like like just like actual cats. Um, all the colors are variable and fun. And then also like their eyes. Um, typically, when you see a cat shark, it's just like the slit eye, which is really cool. Um, but yeah. Uh, it's really cool because there's a, a mix of like dark bands, uh, kind of like a, an orangey, rusty orange background, dark spots, and then light spots. And it's in kind of like this pretty, pretty, uh, it's this beautiful but very delicate, like or like not delicate, intricate arrangement. So uh, this is probably not the easiest shark to draw. Um, so like, again, just kind of bringing attention to your uh, art, Howard, like, this is super cool that you're able to capture this uh, patternation on this species, because that, that definitely looks like uh, Cephalosculium ventriosum, like, like the classic swell shark. Um, so, uh, and it, it's actually really cool. I, I didn't realize there were multiple species of swell shark. Uh, so uh, this was a great suggestion from Sir Douglas Bain as far as uh, this species, because uh, uh, this is the classic one, like the one that most people know. But there's actually quite a few uh, around the world. So uh, it looks like uh, another popular one is in Australia. Uh, but the classic swell shark is um, common in California and uh, kind of the west coast of the United States and I believe Mexico as well. And I think you can find them in, South, in the west coast of South America. So, but yeah, this is gorgeous footage. I, lo I love their eyes, like, like just these like beautiful, like almost golden eyes. Uh, here's a shark in Laguna Beach. This is from Troy McDonald. Let's subscribe to that. Let's check this out. I do love, like, West Coast is so cool, because, uh, like, I, I live on the East Coast of the U.S., and it's just, like, the geography is so different, uh, like, as far as the ocean goes. Like, West Coast has so many, like, 
dramatic like rocky features and like it, it it's a temperate environment but it's like it's almost like a reef you know in terms of just like or like what you think about a coral reef like look at this beautiful purple urchin and and that's a gorgeous fish right there i know we're paying attention to the shark but hold on there was there was a stunning fish just now hold on there it is i have no idea what this is but this like this crazy neon blue thing no i'm not good with pacific fish so i have no idea what that what kind of fish that is but but anyway, here is a swell shark, uh, kind of wedged wedged in. He actually does look a little swollen. Um, I would say this is actually part of the behavior right here, where like that stomach, you can see how it's a lot more rounded. Um, so this actually might be, he might be starting to get into that protective behavior where I kind of suspect this is actually part of that, um, that defense mechanism, because like, like the midpoint of the stomach actually does look a, a bit rounder than normal like not not super dramatically but but definitely um i think that is definitely part of like just like the swell shark's namesake um i'll pull up a picture that better illustrates what i'm talking about but it's a pretty nice size individual uh slightly different coloration uh, so uh, it's 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 the same basic pattern with the dark and um, uh, light alternating like beige, orangish, uh, orangish kind of color. Uh, you can see the light spots toward the, towards the tail end of the shark. Some of it is also kind of covered partially in sediment, so um, that could be kind of blocking it a little bit as well. But I really do love how he's like kind of tucked himself up right next to that rock face. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up a picture to see if we can get a better view of the swelling ability. Um, it's a lot of swell shark. Oh, by the way, swell sharks um, are an egg-laying shark. So uh, these photos right here are um, swell shark egg cases. But I feel like I'm pretty sure there's some popular photos where you can actually really see. like the belly distended. Um, while I'm browsing through this, uh, just uh, East Coast comment. Um, East Coast underwater features uh, usually, typically, like at, le at least south of New York City, uh, very sandy, uh, lots of estuaries. Oh shoot, there doesn't seem to be a picture here. Um, lots of estuaries, uh, very flat, sandy environment, so you don't really get a lot of like those dramatic underwater features. When you get um, uh, east of New York and kind of north, uh, like like up in New England, you you get more of that kind of feel of like um, just just the uh, you know rock reliefs and kind of more like species you would think of more like in a reef uh, kind of environment. But uh, but I'm I'm in I'm in Virginia, so I'm I'm in the area that just does not get that kind of. Um, Okay, this is not this is not a good example because this is an uh, albino swell shark. But actually, I guess, I guess it is a good example um, in terms of like, because like like th this is a rare individual. This this is a swell shark with albinism, so um, it doesn't have any pigmentation. But you can see kind of structurally the feature um, very very clearly. Like what I'm trying to um, what I was talking about with that clip was that this shark is actually behaving perfectly normally and it's swelling up as a defense mechanism so this is how the shark gets its name um, so again this feature is some it, it, it like th this is this is a defensive feature um, to kind of help it like wedge itself in um, reef environments so you can see that the stomach is abnormally large abnormally round um, and this is like a temporary state it's kind of like a puffer fish um, like it's a little bit like of the same kind of idea so, and I just bring that picture up just to kind of like, when you look at this clip again, I feel like you can kind of tell he's partially doing it a little bit. Like this particular individual is partially doing it, you know, just to kind of like wedge himself into that crevice a little bit more and be like harder to dislodge um, or for, harder for a predator to dislodge. So, but uh, yeah, super cool species. And I think, I believe this is the only swell shark on the west coast, but uh, we'll have to double check that. 
Um, it's definitely the most famous. And it's a shark when I was a kid uh, that I grew up with a lot in terms of like, uh, there, there was an aquarium in Washington, D.C. Uh, there were originally two national, I, I think I've talked about this on the stream before, there were two national aquariums, one in Baltimore and one in D.C. And uh, they had this in D.C. because the D.C. Aquarium actually showcased the National Marine Sanctuaries. And there's quite a few in the West Coast, especially I think um, California has like the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. So, um, but uh, yeah. Let's check out this clip. This is from Ed Bierman. Subscribe. I like. I do like this new feature. This is really dumb. But like when you subscribe to a YouTube channel, uh, it kind of goes like party colors, and I, I think it's kind of fun. So, but this is cool. I think this is also. You can kind of barely tell a little bit of bugle pumping, but uh, for the most part, this shark is motionless, just kind of chilling out on the seabed. And clearly not afraid of this diver. Uh, you know, just it's moving, but he's not like in a rush. <laughs> that was actually really cute. Um, you know, not really in a rush to escape, pretty much very calm uh you know and it's kind of amazing when you think about it like you think about like how big a diver is in relation to the swell shark so uh but that's like that's like a fun thing about like if you go snorkeling or diving um a lot of animals are not really used to people and you know they're a little they're definitely bolder or calmer you know they they don't really feel as like um freaked out by uh people so i just really like how it that particular individual uh, tucked itself in. This is a swell shark at Catalina Island, California. It's really cool that most of these are from California, these clips. So this is Diving Catalina. Definitely want to subscribe to that. And I think, I forget the reason why um, for this particular clip, let's make that full screen. I forgot the reason. Oh, that's so cool. Sorry, let's go back to that really quick. Alright, so again, I'm on the East Coast, but this is one of the few fish of the West Coast that I know and that I'm a little I'm a little envious of. This is the California sheep's head. It's a beautiful fish. It's such a weird looking color pattern, like like just like this dark this black, um, pink black combo. But it's so cool. So yeah, California sheep's head, super, super cool fish. Very different from the sheep's head that I have. Um, yeah, totally different group of fish. Ah, beautiful species. So, so cool. And there's our swell shark. Another individual just chilling out on the seabed, tucked away. It's actually, I, I love these kinds of sharks that are just like at home in the kelp forest. And like, like it, it's, it's kind of an enviable lifestyle as far as just like, you know, you're in a sunny environment, you're, you know, you've got all these nooks and crannies to kind of tuck away into, you know, and you're a shark, so you are like a top predator and you're well camouflaged and you can hide from a lot of things. I'm actually kind of curious what would eat swell sharks. Like I would assume maybe sea lions, um, probably other sharks if they can find them. I don't know, but, uh, this seems like a pretty good strategy as far as like, you know, this particular environment being a well camouflaged shark that can hide in little crevices. I don't know. I, I think that's a winning bet. I'm pretty sure swell sharks are least concerned, so they're not an endangered species at all. Also, this is actually really cool. Uh, this was a little subtle, but if you rewind... Hold on. You can actually see it right here. You can actually see this individual is actually swelling up. Um, so keep an eye on the belly. See right there? It is actually swelling up a little bit. Right there. So that's actually not, you know, it's normal stomach. Like that's that's definitely a, like swelling up kind of a distended stomach just to kind of, I think it's probably not thrilled that this diver is here. So it's definitely doing its characteristic ability, which is really cool. I mean, it's, it's cool to see. There's not any other group of sharks that does this, so. Uh, one thing I particularly love about swell sharks, and many cat sharks in general, but definitely swell sharks have this very cool, like, look as far as, um, 
I feel like they have more of like, um, uh, what's the right word? More of a chiseled look, you know, compared to other kinds of cat sharks. Uh, kind of like, you can see more of like a crest above the eye, um, a little bit more of an indent around the snout. Like, they definitely look a little bit more rugged. Uh, like, 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 a little bit more, not rugged, I guess, but like, chiseled. I think chiseled is a good word, uh, as far as cat sharks go. So, it's a, it's a pretty cool, uh, look. Whoop, nope, no ads, no ads! I hate this, I always do this. Sorry about that. I do want to rewatch that clip later, but, okay. Here is a much more active swell shark at night. Look at him! What's kind of cool, I, we definitely want to rewind this again, because it, it, it almost is like, it looks like it's walking almost. Like, like with its uh, pectoral fins, like it looks like it's pushing off the ground a little bit, like like pushing off the sea grad, uh, uh, the seabed with its pectoral fins, um, which is cool because we know that um, um, epaulette sharks do that. Epaulette sharks are a completely different group, but we know that some sharks can do that and they can articulate their pectoral fins pretty well, and you can kind of see that actually if we maybe slow that down and keep an eye on how the pectoral fins are moving yeah I mean yeah it looks like yeah it looks like he's like actively like flapping his pectoral fins you know which is really that's actually really wonderful to see um, that's another kind of myth about sharks like um, I don't know if you've seen that movie Deep Blue Sea, but they were talking about like mako sharks can't swim ba backwards or something like that. I don't know. Um, like, and I know this is a completely different kind of shark, but it's it's kind of cool. You can see it probing around and backing up, and I think that's a sea lion on the left, by the way. Oh wow! But it's a very nimble shark. Yeah, very very it, like even though it's a slow swimmer and it's like sleepy in the daytime or sluggish in the daytime, it's actually pretty. Um, like very flexible, uh, like when in, in in this kind of like hunting mode, very agile. Uh, let's do that at normal speed. Yeah, act. Yeah, definitely, definitely very active here at night. So and adorable. <laughs> Man, I, I would love to swim with swell sharks. Actually, that that would be a, such a cool thing to do someday. Oh man, I would freak out actually. So I've never been to the California coast. I was lucky enough to go to the Washington coast this summer, but I, I was I haven't been able to go to the California coast. So that's something I got to do someday, uh, just to find some swell sharks. So very cool. This video is from Brett Howard. Want to subscribe to that channel? Oh, this is interesting. Um, Divers find a swell shark at Woods Cove, Laguna Beach, California. So these are all California, uh, which is pretty fun. So. Oh, hey, Howard. Uh, sorry, but I, I, I didn't see your comment. Uh, you can see ridges of denticles creating patterns. Interesting. Like, let's see. I'm going to keep an eye on I'm going to look out for that. Oh, this is cool. And I, actually, you capture this in your drawing. Look at, look at it it's tuck, tucking in its tail. Here, let's make this full screen again too. Sorry, because this this is actually a really beautiful clip. And the, like like it's cool to see it's the same species, but it's it, there's a variable pattern. Uh, this one is a lot more orangey in color, uh, more orange spaces, less of the dark bands, uh, less of the light spots too. This this individual has more of the dark spots, but he's curling his tail in, um, just like your drawing, which is really cool. And again, all of these clips, uh, for the most part, swell sharks seem pretty okay with people. Um, as in, like, it's not act it's not rushing to get out of the situation. Oh, look at its eye. Uh, and he might be swelling up a little bit, actually. Uh, yeah. Yep. L look at that. So yeah, he's definitely swelling up a little bit. He's definitely swelling up a little bit. So he. Th so maybe maybe like, you know, just. 
maybe this is a shark that if it is maybe not happy, it's it just swells up and it doesn't really actively try to swim away from the situation. So uh, I'm probably going to take my comment back about maybe the shark is calm. Maybe maybe it really isn't if if it's actually swelling up like that. It's not as dramatic as like the photo we saw earlier, but it's you can kind of you can tell, yeah, because the stomach looks more distended than normal. Yeah, it's definitely doing it. So, uh, it was kind of cool to see is like the pupil is a bit more dilated uh, in these shots, uh, which is actually really great to see because uh, it's night. So, at uh, daytime, the um, pupils create that nice slit look, just like a cat's eye. Um, but at night, uh, they do dilate, um, which is really cool. As far as like light retention goes, just like um, our eyes, you know, they get the pupils get smaller in daytime and larger at nighttime, so same thing. But it's such a pretty shark, so beautiful. Ah, no, I get so excited about these that the ads keep happening. Uh, that was from ja Javi Martin, so subscribe to that. Okay. This is kind of a cute video. Swell shark looks for a spot that feels just right. So, let's see what that means. Bam! Yeah. Active buccal pumping, so actively pumping water over its gills. <laughs> These sharks definitely have more personality, I think, than. Um, I don't know, like, I feel like other, there's other cat shark videos, and for the most part, cat sharks seem very just still and quiet and sluggish. And, like, this, I would say small sharks, at least in the clips that we're seeing, like, they definitely have more of, like, a vibe, like, a personality going on. Like, as far as, like, you know, just, they're definitely, like, what's the word? Like, squirmier, wigglier, like, like just kind of more, like, you know, more active, more excitable than, than other cat sharks, so. Uh, and it looks like this one is actually swelling up as well a little bit. Yep. Yeah, like a little bit, so. Now, for me personally, this is actually really cool to see because I, for the longest time, I really never knew why swell sharks were called swell sharks. Um, I mean, it makes sense, but I, I never really saw this behavior. <laughs> it's a cute face. I never really saw this behavior, um, like, on film, so um, it's, it's actually really cool to kind of connect the dots and have that connection, um, you know, because it's not really something you can explain or show in a book. Like, there's some photos that show it, but uh, just to kind of see it happening in life, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of nice to, like, make that connection and see that, oh, yeah, this is an aptly named species um, in English. Uh, and it's a defensive mechanism uh, just to help it uh, as far as trying to wedge itself into uh, rocky crevices for uh, defense. So, But it's a beautiful species. Um, and uh, it's an orangey shark. Most sharks that we've seen are, you know, these beautiful silvers and, you know, like, or, you know, deep water sharks, more of like a straight, like, brown or black color it's nice to see like a more colorful species you know a, a shallow water uh well camouflaged orange shark so very very beautiful species <laughs> and again it's that is a cute face that is an adorable face oh yeah <laughs> all right well let's hold on that image uh, i just want to double check comments so Oh, cool. Uh, Howard, the uh, brown banded bamboo shark also uses his pectoral fins for walking. Good call. Yep. Good good call. That's also a or lobiform, but but like it's another species that you know has that articulation. So uh, very cool. Uh, I know the patterns are so variable. Yeah. So um, what's really cool about that, by the way, is like uh, at first, like it can be a little daunting to find clips on YouTube, making sure it's like the same species because the patterns are so variable. But what's really cool, and this is like a great trick for like fisheries biology too, is that um, getting the location is really helpful as far as species identification. Um, all of these clips like are in California, um, 
or like most if not all, I think all of them were in California, and that's like the home range for the species, and I'm pretty sure this is the only swell shark in California. Um, so it's like, it just eliminates the possibility of like, uh, I think this is the drop board swell shark and the Australian swell shark. It just eliminates that possibility because it's like, well, this is a specific part of the world that only has one species of this group. So, um, and yeah, they are beautiful. I, I love their faces too. Like that's, that's just like, let's full screen that really quick. Cause that is one adorable sweet shark face So, And again, it's a great example of like. Sharks are beautifully diverse. They're not all, uh, you know, what's in film and what's in pop culture. They could be very, very cute species. So, this is Charlie Lofton. So, let's subscribe to that really cool clip of Swell Shark. So, um, we'll go into. I found a couple cool um, aquarium fact sheets uh, for the Swell Shark uh, before we go into kind of more of our traditional stuff. Like,. Um, like the uh, IUCN Red List and Florida Museum. And then uh, there's a lot of cool science on biofluorescence. So uh, we'll talk about that in a second. It's the first shark that we'll talk, we'll, that, that, that we'll talk about as far as biofluorescence goes. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's, it's a lot of cool material and I'm really excited to dive in. So I'm just gonna take a sip of the tea. All right, meet the swell shark. Let's see. Oh, hey, uh, this is actually kind of cool. Uh, if threatened, the swell shark has an unusual response. It blends, it, it bends its body into a U shape, grasps its caudal fin in its mouth, and swallows a large quantity of seawater, which makes it swell to twice its normal size. This behavior makes it difficult for a predator to bite or evict a swell shark from its rocky crevice. So, what's very cool about that? is um and uh also howard uh good call on the den denticles like this is a great photo where you can actually see them uh very pronounced on like the dark blotches in the body that's really cool and i i bet you that this is probably really specifically very helpful for them to wedge themselves into rocky crevices like i i i i would bet money on that as far as like the dermal denticles are probably that pronounced and that raised so that when the shark does swell up, it, it, it it's like stuck in, in like the rocky crevice. So, and also it could be a defense mechanism too, as far as like if something bites down on it, you know, like it's not maybe the most texturally pleasant thing to eat. So, but anyway, um, what's really cool, um, and your, your drawing ca uh, captures this as well, um, just the caudal fin curling up. Some of the clips we saw, the, the shark was starting to do that. It didn't go all the way. But I didn't realize that um, there was like a progression of that behavior where the caudal fin will curl all the way up to the mouth and then the shark will bite it and you know kind of make a ring um, and keep swelling up so that it, it's inedible. So very, very cool. Uh, this is the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, this is a very, very famous aquarium that I, I'd love to go to someday. Um, I believe they have some incredible exhibits that actually have like the ocean like the actual ocean pumping water into uh the tanks like there's a lot of like you know seawall tanks and such so i would love to go to this place someday uh i also think this is the aquarium that was kind of like the mock-up for um the there's a finding nemo sequel called finding dory and there's a part where they go to california and i'm pretty sure they base it on the monterey bay aquarium so um but uh, anyway, yeah, very famous place. Uh, so it's, it's kind of cool to read their profile on a local species. So let's see. Diet is fishes and crustaceans. Uh, range, Monterey Bay, California to Southern Mexico, also along the coast of Chile. Size up to three feet. Um, family, Scalarinidae, so it is a classic cat shark. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh, this is kind of cool. Um, so swell shark actively sucks in some fishes and captures others by resting open-mouthed and letting prey wander in or be carried in by currents. Interesting. So actively sucking in some fishes, that's actually pretty cool because, um, like I mentioned earlier, it's a buccal pumper, so it actually is pumping water over its gills. 
but um, I'm wondering if it's using something analogous to nurse sharks. Like nurse sharks are famous for like, those are also buccal pumpers and they're famous for like, um, you know, just like ripping prey out of rocky areas and like nooks and crannies like a vacuum um, with powerful like buccal suction. And so I'm assuming that there's a similar mechanism going on with swell sharks, which is pretty wild actually. Let's see. Um, this is just general shark stuff. Uh, swell sharks lay rubbery, rubbery A cases with wiry tendrils at the corners. The tendrils catch on rocks and seaweed, anchoring the A cases and preventing them from being washed ashore. Very cool. Depending on water temperature, the eggs hatch in 9 to 12 months. A, new, a newborn has two, low, two rows of enlarged tentacles down its back that catch on the egg case and aid the shark in pushing itself into its new life in the sea. Ancient legends named the empty egg cases that washed ashore mermaids' purses. Very cool. So we'll keep going, but um, it, it is... Uh, this is really cool to see some of the other sharks that they have at the aquarium. Uh, Pacific spiny dogfish. This is a cousin of the pike dogfish. The file tail cat shark. Leopard sharks. Beautiful species. White tip reef shark. Uh, I don't think you can find that in California, but cool shark. Uh, that's that's more of a tropical end of Pacific species. I could be wrong, I, uh, but I, I don't recall you can find that in California. Um, it is a different aquarium. Aquarium of the Pacific. I uh, kind of want to scan their profile on the swell shark. Uh, fairly common to Southern California waters. Do, do, do. We know the name it comes from their ability to swell their stomach. Commonly found in kelp forests with rocky substrate where their drab color allows them to blend into the background. These sharks attempt to stay clear of divers and snorkelers, which is kind of interesting because again, all of these clips, you know, ads aside, um, all of these clips uh, divers can get pretty close to this species, so, I don't know. But again, uh, it could be just a difference of defense mechanism, because it could be that the shark is just, it is feeling threatened and it's just doing what it does. Uh, most species will run away, but swell sharks, um, will curl up and swell up, so, yeah. Um... This is actually a really cool shot of these beautiful egg cases. It's cool, it's really cool to see especially just like these tendrils having a function of like catching on something like like just seaweed or a rock um, just to kind of become entangled so that the egg cases don't get washed up um, on shore. That's actually a really beautiful shot of a baby a swell shark with his little pectoral fins right here, his tiny head. It's so, so cute. Man, egg laying sharks are really cool. Like, so these are ov o oviparous, are as the scientific name for egg laying sharks. Um, as we know, as we talked about multiple times, uh, sharks have very different modes of reproduction. Some give live birth and some lay eggs, and some do a weird thing where they kind of lay eggs inside the body, but um, then the hatched eggs come out of the mother like live birth. So it's very, very diverse modes of reproduction. So. Oh, hey, uh, Bruce Davidson, aren't they one of the most common species for shark? Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't think so. Um, we could check that actually, uh, cause like uh, Florida Museum of Natural History might have, um, I know they do the, the shark attack file. So, um, I, doubt this species is on there uh, just because it's so small um, but uh, that, that's a good question in terms of like it might do like it might bite uh, you know if provoked but um, yeah let's check that out so also welcome to the stream so uh, uh, glad to have you and um, I was just telling um, Howard earlier that this is actually a year this is this is uh, 
this stream is actually the anniversary of the first uh, live stream, like the first Dr. Jaws live stream party. So first episode was on bull sharks, and uh, we've come a long way. We've talked about a lot of different species um, with a lot of cool moments. I think, uh, again, we'll, well, I'll reminisce more kind of like with a holiday special, but like there's been a lot of great moments. One of my personal favorites was just like seeing a basket shark breach. Like that was the craziest thing that I never thought could happen. I did not realize that Baskin Sharks did that. Like, you know, like white sharks do it, but I had no idea that Baskin Sharks did it. Because I would, I, you would think a Baskin Shark is too big, you know, and kind of like too slow moving, you know, but they do it. Um, and there's actually clips of that on YouTube of Baskin Sharks breaching, so really cool. But yeah, let's check out, let's scan ahead. I do want to see, let's see. So danger to humans. The swell shark is considered harmless, preferring to avoid, uh, preferring to avoid contact with humans. It only becomes aggressive when stepped on, harassed, and may inflict a superficial wound. So to answer your question, Bruce, it probably is not on the shark attack file. However, you might be thinking of nurse sharks, because nurse sharks do that. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I just saw your comment. I was referring to the nurse shark. Yes, you're right about nurse sharks. So nurse sharks definitely do that, um, where it's like people. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Like people like look at nurse sharks and they think they're very cute and they touch them and harass them and then nurse sharks will just turn around and they snap um you know because it's like you know like it, it's not good to touch you people really should not like be touching sharks in general um you know just in terms of like 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 unless the shark comes up to you because there's a lot of dive experiences and ecotourism experiences where the shark will come up to you and you can you know like touch them and everything but like but for those divers who actively pursue nurse sharks and then pet them, and you know, they'll 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 snap at you. So you're absolutely right about that. But um, what's funny is like even though this is a different species, um, we were just talking about earlier that um, you know, swell sharks and nurse sharks they have kind of like um, you know similar uh, behavior as far as like buccal pumping, chilling on the seabed actively sucking in prey from rock crevices so it's pretty cool that they're totally different orders uh carcarinoforms and orlectoloboforms but they have similar behavior uh so it's pretty cool to see that so let's see what else florida museum natural history has to say do, 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 do. Do. Huh, this is cool uh, English names, uh, Puffer Shark. So Swell Shark is the famous name, but Puffer Shark is another name for this. I've never heard of that before, but that's kind of cool to see. Let's see. No commercial fisheries. Um, public, tank, uh, public display aquarium facilities often include the Swell Shark in their tanks as it is able to survive cap captivity for extended periods of time. That totally makes sense to me. This is a species that is very sluggish, comfortable sitting on the seabed. That totally makes sense to me. That as far as like a public aquarium keeping a shark, swell sharks are pretty pretty okay to keep. So conservation, swell shark is currently listed as least concern. So it's nice to see a shark that is doing okay. Um we got the range, so uh, Southern California to Mexico and then Chile. Habitat. Um, let's see. Species resides over continental shelves and upper slopes in temperate and subtropical waters. It can be found to depths of 457 meters. However, it's more common at 5 to 37 meters. So really awesome dive shark, you know, because that, that's a really great range for dive, diving. So... Uh, the preferred habitat of the swell shark is rocky algal, uh, or sorry, algal covered bottoms. During the day, the small sluggish shark hides in caves and rocky crevices, camouflaged with its surroundings. As night approaches, the swell shark moves out to adjacent sandy bottoms in search of food. It ambushes prey items or rests quietly on the bottom with its mouth wide open. This part is really cool. Um, I don't think we've ever seen a shark that does that. Um, you know, like angel sharks, you know, are famous ambush predators, but like. Um, not like this, like, as far as, like, it's almost like a alligator in a kind of funny way, where it's, like, you know, quietly on the bottom with its mouth wide open. I know, I know alligators don't have their mouths open for that reason, but, like, I don't know. It's pretty cool, though. Um, a shark just sitting on the seabed with its mouth open, waiting for an unsuspecting victim. 
Although the spell strike is primarily solitary, it sometimes forms aggregations while resting, with individuals sometimes piled on top of each other. I think that first clip was showing... Yeah, there we go. That first clip was showing that. Yeah, there's two, there's two soul strikes and these buddies in this rock crevice, so... It's kind of it's funny, funny that, that they, you know... They, they, seem, they like seem like they're just kind of like chilling, chilling out, out and... You know, you know, tucked away. Tucked away. It's, it's not, does not look like anything. Anything like mating. Like mating. It's, it's just. 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 Oh, hey, oh, hey. Uh, when, when the threat the passes, passes, the Swell Shrek makes a dog-like bark when expelling the water. Wow, if the Swell Shrek is caught and brought to the surface, it can also swell its body with air in the same manner as it does with water. Pretty interesting. Interesting. Um, I know sand tigers uh, also gulp air, for, uh, but they do that for neutral buoyancy. Um, but it's, it's cool to see, a, a, again, it's a completely different order, uh, but a different shark species that, like, can, that can utilize air for uh, some, some function. So that's, that's pretty cool. Oh, hey, Bruce, you're, 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 oh, no, yeah, you're, you're good, Bruce. Uh, as far as, I just saw your comment. I wasn't saying it was okay, I'm just saying it happens. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. So, yeah. And I, I think Howard was just referring to just the general public, like, you know, don't pester wild animals, so... Um, but also, uh, Bruce, uh, where, where, um, where do you hail from as far as, like, um, like if you're in the U.S., if you're in the United States, like, which state, or, uh, we've got, a lot, like, a lot of like, Canadian viewers, uh, just out of curiosity, uh, feel free, uh, to share or not share, either way is fine, uh, just out of curiosity. I was just saying earlier, um, I'm on the East Coast, uh, Swell Sharks on the West Coast, and some of the clips are really cool to see, um, as far as, like, like, uh, the differences between the East Coast and West Coast, like East Coast is just very like, um, you know, flat and sandy, and the West Coast more rocky. Like if you're in the North Northeast, it's rocky as well, but it's it's just kind of cool to see, you know, like the difference. Um, and like even though I love the East Coast, it's you know I do kind of miss like swimming in rocky reef environments where the water is clear and you can see a lot of cool things tucked away. So. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. That's weird. Okay, this shark's mouth is proportionally larger than the mouth of the white shark. That's kind of crazy when you think about it. Um, let's take a look at that cute little image again at the end. Uh, that's, that's actually really cool. I mean, it's absolutely right. Like, uh... You know, this is actually a really good angle to illustrate that. It, and it, it's kind of more of like a compressed mouth, too. Like, like kind of like, 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 oops. You know, I mean, now I'm kind of curious about this whole feature of the, the shark, like, just sitting on the seabed with its mouth open. Because um, it is kind of more of like a, I don't know if I'm using the term right, like a laterally compressed mouth. So it's just kind of like... Um, I don't know. As far as it being an ambush predator and having a larger mouth proportionally than a great white, like, I don't know, that's pretty cool. Uh, kind of remind. I mean, if you had it, if you took this view and applied it to a different body, it kind of looks like an angel shark. You can kind of make that connection. I don't know. That, that's a cool. That's a cool observation. I didn't realize that. That was a feature of the species, so. Let's see. The eyes have nicotine lower eyelids, so just like our, all Carcharinoforms, which is super cool. So. Oh, hey! Awesome! Uh, Bruce is uh, hailing from uh, British Columbia near Vancouver. Very, very cool. Uh, regular forests and kelp forests are what we have in my neck of the woods. Awesome! Awesome! Dude, kelp forests are awesome. Like, um, I was in Washington State uh, last July, and I was fortunate enough, like, I, that was the first time I was in a, a Pacific kelp forest, and it was the coolest thing ever. Like, like it's a beautiful, it's not quite the same, um, and, like, I, I, I have a friend who ventures to BC, 
and like she loves that area like 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 the wildlife is just spectacular and she's a she's a huge um or or orca whale fan and I, i think there's a lot more orca activity in canada than there is in washington there's still a lot in washington but um super cool environment um like like very very cool so uh let's see do, 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 do. but yeah welcome welcome to the stream uh this, this is awesome awesome um i really thought we have a lot of we have a we have an even amount of americans and canadians on the stream and i, I i'm very proud of that this, this is a north american stream thus far i we i'd love to love to get more people from around the world but i like our north american group it's, it's a it's a pretty good group we are, I was about to say we're NORAD, but that's just like, that's not the vibe of, of shark science. So, um, let's see. I am very curious about the dentition because you can see in the clips, um, you know, even though this is a small, cute shark, I'm trying to find a good clip. Uh, the, te- the teeth are actually fairly pronounced. You know, it's not like a flat um, comb or not, not, not a comb. Like, here we go. Yeah. That's what I was looking for. Even though these are tiny teeth, they're definitely like upright and pronounced teeth. And I would not want to be on the receiving end of that if I was like a fish. Yeah, those are actually, you know, those are pretty good looking teeth. So, um, curious about, um, large mouth of swell shark contains numerous small teeth, usually having three smooth edge cusps, but may have, but each may have up to five cusps. Central cusp is extending further than the others. Each jaw contains 55 to 60 teeth. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, as a nocturnal predator, this shark feeds primarily on small reef fishes, as well as any prey items that can easily fit in its mouth. Um, these include mollusks, crusta- crustaceans, uh, this shark feeds by actively sucking in small fishes or by capturing other prey items by remaining motionless on the bottom with its mouth wide open, waiting for prey to wander in or be swept in by the currents. Swell sharks will sometimes enter lobster traps in search of an easy meal. <laughs> That's actually really cute. Let's see. Uh, we talked about reproduction already. With uh, This is an egg-laying shark. Uh, the tendrils on the eggs... Uh, catch rocks or seaweed uh, to help secure it uh, so that the eggs are safe from ocean currents. Okay, here we, I was curious about this. Okay, predators. Predators include larger sharks and marine mammals, including seals. Got you. Marine snails often bore holes in the tough protective coating of the egg cases, consuming the developing embryo. Yikes. Man, you would think a snail is not an uh, not a predator, not an of dangerous, offensive creature, but yeah, yikes. So, all right. Uh, taxonomy. I'm kind of curious about where the name comes from. The genus name Cephalosculium is derived from the Greek kephla, meaning head, and skela, meaning the kind of shark. So, I guess head shark. The species name Ventriosa means large belly, referring to the shark's ability to swallow large amounts of water, doubling its body size when threatened. So this is a really good article from Florida Museum of Natural History. Nice overview of the swell shark. Um, I do want to be mindful of time because I do want to definitely jump into biofluorescence in a little bit. So we'll uh, just kind of, we'll probably skip fish space because I'm sure fish space doesn't have anything new um, for tonight. So let's see. Uh, oh, the da 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 Okay. Sorry about that. I just saw a bunch of flat earth comments. So I have uh, banned. J- so I won't even say the name, but yeah. I don't know if you guys saw those comments, but I apologize for that. Like, uh, it was just flat earth spanny- spam- spamming. So that was the first ban ever on the stream. So yeah. Like, no offense. It's not against you personally. It's just about. That's just not science, so, yeah. But anyway, uh, Howard, uh, do you know about the Hornby Island fossil shark material? Um, oh yeah, sorry, I, I, I think I think you're asking Bruce that. But um, Hornby Island is awesome. That was one of the early features of our stream. Um, we are talking about it, so super, super cool. And that's actually a fun, that's another thing, that's probably the biggest thing 
yeah, I promise I won't like reminisce too too much, but like that was one of the biggest things I learned this year was just like shark paleonto paleontology. Um, like I am better with living sharks, and I'm definitely a lot better with Atlantic living sharks than um, other parts of the world. But um, like you know, just paleontology and prehistoric sharks that was something I, I really did not know as well. And um, it was really cool to like learn from you guys more about like just the fossil assemblages and uh, just like how diverse and like how like wild prehistoric sharks were. And then also uh, my, one of my biggest things that I learned is uh, just like the lineage of white sharks, makos, megalodons, how they're all actually very different. Like in that a white shark is closer to a mako shark. Like a white shark is actually potentially like a super derived mako shark and they're actually closer to each other than they are to like mega tube sharks. Like mega tube sharks are a totally different group, which is which I never knew. Um, like, and I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and that there's like, uh, I have these, you know, I still have these. Um, there we go. So we got, I've got these like mega tube shark teeth, but this is not a megalodon. This is um, anguistidans, like Carcocles. Uh, Anguistidans. So this is a different kind of uh, mega tube shark, uh, which is you know really cool. I never knew that before, and I never really knew my shark timeline as well. So that was a big thing. And I really learned from you guys, honestly. Um, like one, that was one big thing, education-wise, I learned this year. Um, and also, uh, like I'm slightly ashamed to say it. Like I thought I knew my stuff as far as shark biodiversity goes, but like. These Pacific species and these deep water species, like, wow, I had, n I really, like, like, was not as, like, well-versed as I thought I was as far as, like, the deep water and the Pacific species, because I'm very, very focused on Atlantic sharks, so, like, to kind of branch out like that and to really see more of, like, the diversity and, like, the palette of, like, you know, there's, like, 500 sharks in the world, like, of course I don't know, like, like, as much as I thought as far as sharks go, so... Uh, that was another really fun thing for this year. Um, I use Salmon Red List. The Swell Shark is least concerned, so it's uh, it's good to see again that it's actually doing okay. Um, you know, many sharks are vulnerable or endangered, but it's nice to see a happy shark that is doing fine. Um, I just want to scan why it's least concerned. Do, 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 do. It's not in commercial fisheries. Um, minor bycatch, it's not really edible, given that there's no value for the meat or fins of Baja California, such low discard suggests the species may be indeed uncommon in gill, by, gill net bycatch, there's no demand for the meat or fins, the species assesses least concern throughout its range, very cool. So again, very very nice to see that it's actually doing okay. So very happy to see that because many sharks are not doing okay. Um, Sharkreferences.com. Um, I don't know uh, how many uh, streams you've seen, but uh, um, this website is awesome. Like, um, and, and for more to Bruce, um, like if if you're a huge like a huge shark fan and you want to learn more, Sharkreferences.com is amazing. It has every single species and has like a really cool breakdown of science. From each species so um but this is a real good landing page for like deeper shark science um beautiful photo by andy merck who's a fantastic underwater photographer of the swell shark so very cool beautiful species so. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, these are actually gorgeous photos of the species. And I, I love seeing photos of the shark, like, with, like, just, like, the purple urchins. So cool. Super cool. Alright. So, yeah. Um, let's see. I want to check out this paper. This is the Covert wor World of Fish Biofluorescence, a phylogenetically widespread and phenotypically variable phenomenon. So these next couple papers, these are more on um, 
a couple, a little bit of Swell Shark uh, biology, but um, these are actually going to be more on like the phenomenon of biofluorescence, which we have not seen before. We've seen bioluminescence as far as like sharks lighting up in deep water environments, but we haven't seen like this kind of phenomenon where I think this is like if you subject the shark to different wavelengths of light, and I forget exactly how this works, but if you subject, subject the shark to different wavelengths of light, you'll be able to see a fluorescent glow. Um, I know corals have this, um, but I think swell sharks is one of the few vertebrates that's, that has this, so. Um, let's see, really quickly. Just wanna check on something before we dive in. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I just saw your comment, Bruce. Um, so, uh, did you mean... Sorry. Um, yeah, let me see if I can make this smaller. This is... Um, the name of the website is sharkreferences.com. And actually, let me put this in the comment. Uh, sharkreferences.com. So this is a super cool website. Um, like, uh, and actually, I wonder if I can do extant. Oh no, let me let me get back to this page, the extant ballad page. Okay. And I'm actually gonna post this link in here directly. Perfect. Awesome. So. Um, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, of course. Like, like my, my pleasure, man. Like, um, so, uh, so yeah, this website is super cool. It also has fossil species on it. So, um, but I like the extant valid uh, species list because it's a nice, quick way to get to a specific shark. So let's do. Um, uh, what am I gonna do for? Let's let's do let's do the classic uh, dogfish. Um, I can just click S for Squalus uh, acanthus. I go down the list. Here it is, Squalus acanthus. I could just click on this blue box. The, it says SR for shark references. And it takes me to the landing page, which has a description of the dogfish. But the best part about this website is I can click on this box called literature references. And it has all of these papers. Um, if you want to like take a closer look at um, just shark science in general. So, um, and that, that's where I got um, these papers to review for tonight as far as like biofluorescence goes for the swell shark. So um, these papers right here, um, like uh, if, if you wanna uh, just take a look at this website, uh, the ones with the green icon uh, usually are, are, are downloadable and they're usually like publicly accessible. So um, yeah, they're super fun. They can be very old. A lot of like old science from like the 1800s and 1900s um, is scanned into like library co collections so you can actually find some beautiful plates on sharks like this one actually That's actually a really cool older plate from 1888 on this dogfish. So But um, but yeah a lot of cool stuff on sharkreferences.com. I would say as far as websites go It's the best one. It's my absolute favorite one as far as like just really getting into the nitty-gritty of shark science. It's super cool. So All right, but let's check out shark bio biofluorescence. So here we go, starting with the covert world of fish biofluorescence, a phylogenetically widespread and phenotypically variable phenomenon. So this is from John Sparks, Robert uh, Shelley, uh, W. Leo Smith, Matthew P. Davis, Dan Chernov, Vincent A. Pierrebone, and David F. Gruber. So here we go. Uh, I think this might be Doc Gruber, actually. This might be, that might be Doc Gruber. Um, if you remember from the uh, Jess stream, I think that's who she was referring to. So, very cool. Um, as always, we just read the abstract out loud and then we just kind of scan through the rest. But here we go. The discovery of fluorescent proteins has revolutionized experimental biology. Whereas a majority of fluorescent proteins have been identified from cnidarians, so these are like um, jellyfish, recently several fluorescent, uh, and coral, coral are cnidarians too. Recently, several fluorescent proteins have been isolated across the animal tree of life. Here we show that biofluorescence is not only phylogenetically widespread, but is also phenotypically variable across both cartilaginous and bony fishes, highlighting its evolutionary history and the possibility for discovery of numerous novel fluorescent proteins. 
Fish biofluorescence is especially common in morphologically variable and cryptically patterned coral reef lineages. We identified 16 orders, 50 families, 105 genera, and more than 180 species of biofluorescent fishes. We have also reconstructed our current understanding of the phylogenetic distribution of biofluorescence for ray finned fishes. The presence of yellow long pass intraocular filters in many biofluorescent fish lineages and a substantive color vision capabilities of coral reef fishes suggests. Oh, that's so cool. Sorry, I know it's a mouthful, but let me let me read that again. The presence of yellow long pass intraocular filters in many bio, biofluorescent fish lineages and a substantive color vision capabilities of coral reef fishes suggests they are capable of detecting fluorescent light. That's really cool. Okay, so one thing I really loved when I was kind of first learning about the ocean and um, marine science is that many species of fish can see wavelengths of light that we cannot see. And so basically, like, they're living in this, like, different reality, you know, in terms of, like, they're seeing colors that we can't imagine. You know, like, our spectrum of light and our spectrum of colors, um, you know, we think that's, like, what the, the world is, right? But, like, what's really cool is that, you know, right now there are animals that kind of see it in a different way and are basically, like, we're sharing the same planet, but, like, they're, they're picking up on, like, a different... I don't want to say a different dimension because I think that's confusing ideas, but, like... They're, they're picking up like like on this like different view of the same thing uh, which is, I, I think is absolutely remarkable so they're seeing colors that we can't comprehend and we can't imagine and I personally really love that because you know it, it's like I feel like humanity sometimes overrates itself a little bit sometimes and it's kind of nice to see that like there's abilities that we don't have and like animals who do things that we cannot possibly imagine doing I, I just think that's really cool, and there's something very beautiful about that. So, uh, we present species-specific emission patterns among closely related species, indicating that biofluorescence potentially functions in interspecific communication, and ev evidence that fluorescence can be used for camouflage. This research provides insight into the distribution, evolution, and phenotypic variability of biofluorescence in marine lineages, and examines the role this variation may play. That is super cool. So. All right. So, oh man, this is cool. All right, so we've got our swell shark on the top. Just wanna make that bigger. There we go. Now, um, it's gonna be interesting as we read more about this because I don't really know, um, it, it's kind of hard to tell, um, is this green, is this green hue, like, kind of like a model as far as, like, trying to communicate what this sort of looks like in a fluorescent view, or is this, like, literally what the color is if you're, like, looking at it in a fluorescent view. I'm not really, I, I am not as familiar with biofluorescence, so um, it'll be interesting to kind of read this more but the basic gist is these are streaks of color and spectrums of color that are actually really not i'm just, i don't think they're visible to the naked eye um so and the point is like these kind of like seemingly hidden streams of color might be helpful for camouflage or helpful for communicating between species so um i'm just gonna check out swell shark oh or shark. Hmm. A few instances of green biofluorescence have also been reported in deep water cat sharks. The presence of biofluorescence in these deep water taxa that spend their lives primarily in the dark beyond the reach of the high energy blue light necessary for excitation of fluorescence is curious from a functional perspective. Biofluorescence in these taxa potentially represents an ancestral condition in lineages whose shallow water relatives also exhibit biofluorescence. Hmm. Okay, yeah, let's kind of scan this.
so the idea is biofluorescence might be helpful for communication or mating, as has been observed in parrots. Interesting. Uh, fluorescence may be exploited in fish to produce visual contrast and patterns in otherwise cryptically patterned or camouflaged species that blend in well on the reef in shallow sunlit waters. And then for deep water cat sharks who have biofluorescent, but it doesn't really do anything for them, it might be just like an ancestral trait, like something that's like, it's just not really functional. Like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Like, um, uh, and it's, it's Monday. I can't think of a good example. Like, like, um, like whales, uh, whales are the first thing that came to mind. Like whales have like hip bones, but they don't have legs. So like, you know, just that kind of thing. So let's see. I'm just kind of scanning through this. This is like the chill part of the study party, so feel free to ask any questions along the way. Let's see. Recent evidence indicates that sharks and rays also exhibit color, fish, uh, color vision. Many of the fishes we find to exhibit biofluorescence, such as sharks, lizard fishes, scorpion fishes, blah, 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 blah. Also possess yellow intraocular filters. Enables the species to visualize and potentially exploit for fluorescence to enhance visual contrast and patterns that are unseen to other fishes and predators that lack in this visual specialization. So this is like a complicated way of saying that like, with these additional layers of color, these help with like additional layers of camouflage or additional layers of communication or additional layers of hunting. Uh, which is really cool. So, we might move on to the next article, because there's not a lot of stuff on the shark specifically, and I do want to kind of see how this works with the swell shark specifically, but it's a cool concept. Interesting. Moonlight in shallow ocean waters could potentially provide the appropriate excitation energy for green and red biofluorescence in fishes. And as a result, species-specific biofluorescent patterning may provide an added layer of species recognition during the spawning phase. So under moonlight conditions, maybe some of this biofluorescence comes out so that, because um, a, a lot of animals do time their spawning season with the moon. Um, that is something that happens in the Chesapeake Bay where um, like there's like a chain reaction where like a lot of like marine invertebrates will spawn during a full moon um and a lot of like other animals kind of follow suit um so um and coral reefs do that coral reefs do that too so um yeah that's actually really cool uh, the idea that maybe like in these special moonlight spawning moment moments like maybe the moonlight itself might excite biofluorescence which helps these individuals find each other. That's, that is such a cool idea. Let's see. So I think we might have covered most of this. Oh, interesting. I know this is not our shark, but this is one of the ideas um, is that um, so in biofluorescence you see that this uh, group of like coral or sponge is red um, this group is biofluorescing green and then this particular scorpion fish is also red and he's choosing to be with this kind of group of sponges as opposed to this green group of sponges so this might be helping them with camouflage on this different wavelength of light, which is really, really radically cool idea. Very cool. Let's see.
Okay, I don't need to go through that. Okay, so it's a cool article, cool introduction. We'll keep going because I want to find something that's more shark specific. And this looks like a good place. Uh, so biofluorescence in cat sharks, fundamental description and relevance for Elazobank visual ecology. That sounds like very promising. This is David F. Gruber, uh, Elise, uh, sorry, Ellis R. Lowell, Dimitri uh, Dehine, uh, Daria Akainak, uh, Jean Gaffney, uh, W. Leo Smith, Matthew P. Davis, Jennifer H. Stern, Vincent A. Pierbone, John S. Sparks. So it's actually really cool. A lot of these authors are actually the same authors from the other paper. This one's from 2016. Let's double check in the comments. Oh, awesome, Howard. Uh, vestigial leg is... Sorry, <laughs> I can't speak. V vestigial legs and snakes. Good call for a, a trait that's like a weird... Um, like, it's non-functioning. Good call. That, yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to, trying to come up with. So thank you. Let's see. So, abstract. Uh, biofluorescence has recently been found to be widespread in marine fishes, including sharks. Cat sharks, such as the swell shark from the eastern Pacific and the chain cat shark from the western Atlantic, hey, this one's in my backyard, are known to exhibit bright green fluorescence. Okay, so this is something specific um, to these species. Uh, it's specifically green. Okay. We examine the spectral sensitivity and visual characteristics of these reclusive sharks while also considering the fluorescent properties of their skin. Spectral absorbance of the photoreceptor cells in these sharks revealed the presence of a single visual pigment in each species. Uh, swell sharks exhibited a maximum absorbance of 484 plus or minus 3 nanometers, and an absorbance, so this is just how they see light, whereas um, chain cat sharks, different kind of, uh, uh, relatively the same range. Yeah, never mind. Uh, using the photoreceptive properties derived here, a shark eye camera was designed and developed that yielded contrast information on areas where fluorescence is anatomically distributed on the shark, as seen from other sharks' eyes of these two species. That was a mouthful, but if I'm reading that correctly, I think they kind of made a shark vision model where, um, you know, when we look at the cat shark, we've got this beautiful beige chain, you know, color pattern color pattern we look at the sh swell shark we see this like beautiful orange spot you know color pattern but from the shark's perspective we might be seeing something different so i'm excited to look at the figures for this uh let's see phylogenetic investigations indicate that biofluorescence has evolved at least three times in cartilaginous fishes the repeated bio evolution of biofluorescence in the lazarbranks coupled with a visual adaptation adaption to detect it and evidence that biofluorescence creates greater luminosity contrast with the surrounding background, highlights the potential importance of bio biofluorescence in a lazarbrink behavior and biology. So again, lots of, lots of, it's a mouthful, but it's an extremely cool concept. So let's kind of check out. Okay, here we go. Okay, so figure A is the bioluminescent pattern, or sorry, the biofluorescent, sorry, biofluorescent pattern of the swell shark, and then figure B is like normal light conditions. So, so when you, let's see. Okay. Um, between the two images, it looks largely the same to me. Um, although, it, what's interesting is that um, in normal light, when you look at like kind of the orange parts of the swell shark, you can see that those are actually green um, in fluorescent light. Um, the dark blotches are, you know, retaining their dark pigmentation. But um, but it's kind of cool that these like pale cream orange color areas are the ones that are also fluorescent. So I wonder if that's for a specific kind of reason. Okay, here is the shark that's in my neck of the woods, the chain cat shark. And a similar thing, like the light 
um, areas have the biofluorescent, and then these like dark areas, like the dark chains, don't really have it. So um, the nice cream color that I'm used to is green under this specific wavelength of light. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Need to take a drink of water, sorry. Hmm. All right, so figure A, let me make sure I have these right. Okay, so figure A is white light. So, okay, I see what's going on. So, cause this is, does it show me how deep this is? No. Okay, so you know how like light is filtered out um, the deeper you go? So like when you dive deeper and deeper into the ocean, um, red light disappears at about 10 meters, orange light disappears at about 25 meters, yellow light disappears um, 50 meters? And then, you know, this is part of why the ocean is blue, um, is that like the other colors filter out at the surface layer. Blue light penetrates the deepest, uh, so at about like 200 meters. So, um, so natural lighting is actually figure B. So you see in natural lighting, this is definitely a blue-green color. And here's a swell shark just chilling out, um, pretty well camouflaged in this rocky reef environment. Um, you know, and in natural light conditions, it's just like the colors that are that we can see are blue or green. Now the diver turned on his dive light um, in figure A, so you can see white light, um, you know, flashing all of the spectrums of the uh, all of the color spectrums like red, yellow, orange, everything. Um, so we can see like a clearer view of what the shark is doing, and it still looks really well camouflaged. It still looks really like tucked away um, in this equally orangey, you know, brown environment. So that actually looks pretty camouflaged. So under natural conditions, whether you have a dive light on or not, it looks pretty well camouflaged. But then when you do this fluorescence, the shark clearly sticks out. Uh, so this is definitely distinct from its environment. So it's kind of cool where is this a way for swell sharks to find each other? You know, like in, in, the, comp, in the spatially complex reef environment? Is this kind of like um, Arkham Asylum <laughs> where like Batman has his special bat vision and can find, you know, it's not the same. I know it's not the same, but like, you know, or Metroid, any of the Metroid Prime games where Samus can turn on a different visor. <laughs> like, you know, it's, I mean, it, it's not the same thing, but like, it's kind of like, an analogous concept where it's like, is this a way for swell sharks to find each other? It's like a different lens of the same world. I'm curious what the discussion is going to yield. Uh, how do I get out of here? What, what happened? Very cool though. I like, I, I love this paper. I kind of love this field. Like this is super, super cool. Oh, wow. Now this is cool. So this is how they're getting these images. So this is a biofluorescent camera. So it's shining this crazy, this, this crazy light. Um, and you can actually see the swell shark in this image right here. Like this little patch of like blue and uh, white right here. That's actually the swell shark because of the pattern. You can definitely tell that's the swell shark. So that's his head right there actually. Very cool. This this is really cool science. Um, okay. Okay. Here we go. The shark camera. Oh man, this is a little tricky. Uh, hold on. Beige black patch intensity between the actual shark eye camera and our simulation. Uh, 
Um, I think I see what they're trying to do, although this is a little confusing. So there is a swell shark in this photo on the top left, and here he is. Shark Eye Camera B image, Shark Eye Simulation B image, Shark Eye Camera RGB image, red, 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 blue, red, green, and blue. Shark Eye Simulation red, green, and, and blue. The shark is more distinct in the second photo, but I'm, I'm kind of frankly not 100% sure what this is showing me. We're showing us. I don't know. If I'm reading this correctly, White light. So I, I uh, let's let's skip to the discussion. I th I'm gonna guess and like let let me know what you guys think this is kind of showing because I think what this is showing if I'm if I'm reading this correctly. So under white light, a shark doesn't really see the patterns of like you know its fellow shark, but under the fluorescent light, it definitely sees those patterns. Um, a human can see the patterns in fluorescent light or white light, but a shark can't. A shark really sees its fellow shark more so from that fluorescent spectrum. I think this is what this is showing me, but I'm not 100% sure. Let me know what you guys think, because uh, th this is a really, this is such a cool field. It's just like, these graphs, I'm not 100% sure what they're kind of illustrating as far as like what, like I think the gist is like, you know, what is it that sharks are seeing when they're looking for each other? But, um... Hmm. Oh. Uh, this is kind of cool. Um, I, I do want to skip to this discussion, but this is kind of like a cool, like, um... Excuse me. Um... Okay. These are groups of elastobranchs that show biofluorescence. So you've got the American Route Stingray has been known to show biofluorescence. You've got a Wobegon. So I, it looks like all of Electro or Electrolopidae, so all of the Wobegons show biofluorescence. And then you've got the Swell Shark, the Chain Cat Shark, and then Scalarinus Canicula is, uh, I want to say that's, I forget which one that is. It's a, it's a different kind of cat shark. It's, um, I really should know that one because I think that one is also near where I live, actually. Small, small, small spotted cat shark. So. Well, well, one thing that's kind of cool that I'm noticing is like these are all bottom dwelling animals. These are all bottom dwelling animals that, that rely like these two, these two definitely, definitely like, these cat like, sharks and the Libby Gons. They definitely, they definitely sit on the sea bed and they do rely, rely on camouflage. And then, and then the stingray. I don't know, I don't know much about the American stingray, stingray, but I would, I would assume. assume Based on, based on its pattern of spots, spots that, that this is also maybe a species, species that, that, that relies on the camouflage. So, so, so it's kind of cool to see that across, that across this, this spectrum. spectrum. Like, um, you know, these, these are all these are all kinds of sharks, sharks, sharks but maybe, maybe they're actually, they're actually like, like kind of doing something similar as far as like they're using biofluorescence as an additional layer of camouflage. Like that's kind of really cool if that's the case. So. Oh, cool. Uh, Bruce, uh, some scientists believe that they use this to identify males and females. Very cool. Super, super cool. Like, and that actually would be very handy. Um, I think it, this was in this photo, like, because, like, what if, like, you are a swell shark, like, looking for a mate, and, you know, you're navigating the reef environment, and you can kind of see the spectrum, 
and you can kind of maybe clearly see the difference between like a male and a female soul shark. Like that's a cool, that's a really cool theory. Super, super cool. Uh, good call, good call on that. Um, let's see, so discussion. Uh, let's see. Uh, light from the sun is quickly absorbed in the ocean. This is in the ideal environment for marine organisms to evolve biofluorescent compounds that absorb abundant blue, high energy, short wavelength photons, which emit back at longer, lesser energy wavelength. Okay. Biofluorescence had the effect of increasing color and brightness contrast ratio of the perceived intensity of light and therefore increasing the visibility of sharks I like this there's often a tendency to describe animal coloration and pigmentation pattern from the perspective of the human visual system this is problematic because not only is color a sensation defined relative to the human visual system but also the number of photoreceptors in the human eye and their spect spectral sensitivities differ greatly from most animals especially those that live in aquatic habitats that's super cool so it's it's kind of like it's like we're only seeing what we're able to see like th this this kind of gets into philosophy where it's like you know it's talking about perception itself like i can only see a limited number of colors and i really appreciate this line um just kind of like illustrating like hey keep this in mind like we all as human beings have a limited number of colors like like as far as like what we can see and it's erroneous to assume that this applies to everything in the world that like you know we have to allow the possibility of understanding that like animals see in different colors animals see in different wavelengths and so like maybe some color patterns that don't make sense to us like make sense to these other animals on the different wavelengths um super cool and like like it's also awesome especially in a reef environment because a reef environment is structural structurally so complex um, there's so many different like uh, organisms like from corals and sponges and fishes and invertebrates like there's so much going on in the reef that um, like you know this might be a way to kind of help navigate that um, and there's a lot of bizarre colors on a coral reef too that don't immediately seem camouflage right like think about like a moorish idol like like you know the fish in finding nemo that's voiced by willem dafoe like <laughs> Like, it's a weird fish. It's like black, white, and yellow. Like, that doesn't really make much sense. Like, what is it blending in with, you know, if anything, you know? And, like, yeah, on a different spectrum, it might make more sense. So, super, super cool idea. I, I, I love this stuff. I really, this, this, is, this is the coolest thing to me. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Um... Uh, two species of cat sharks out here possess essentially a monochromatic vision typical of nocturnal or deep dwelling species, which is intriguing as their visual pigment is slightly green shifted. Okay, we know that the sharks produce green fluorescence. Biofluorescence enhances luminosity contrast of the surrounding marine environment. Found that fluorescence increased the contrast between the gray and beige patches of the shark skin for both species. Okay. The luminosity contrast created by shark biofluorescence can result in a con specific being more apparent than the non fluorescent shark. Uh, 
Oh. Okay. Okay, so if I'm understanding this correctly, if you're not seeing things with a fluorescent vision, if you're seeing things with white light, then the deeper you go, the harder it is to see the shark. But if you kind of can see this fluorescent vision, which is what I think they're trying to figure out as far as like, do sharks kind of see on a different wavelength, um, it doesn't matter how deep you go because this species actually can fluoresce uh, still. Like, like you can actually see the contrast and the, the pattern and identify that, hey, that's a shark. You know, like if you're a shark swimming and trying to find another shark, kind of like Bruce said as far as mating goes, if you're trying to find a mate and it's like a dark environment, um, you can kind of still see a potential mate while like, you know, not being distracted by other elements of the coral reef. So this is extremely cool. But sorry about that. I just noticed a comment about the audio. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, we're almost, um, since it's 1030, um, please let me know in the comments uh, what shark you'd like to do next week. We'll, we'll keep going through the science and everything, but um, just want to give some time as far as next week's sharks. Um, Bruce, since this is, uh, I think you've been on the stream before, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, either way, like, um, uh, welcome to have you and just uh, feel free to uh, lead the way as far as next week's shark. If you have any suggestions, uh, please leave a comment. Because, um, like, every week um, while we do the streams, um, we like to, um, like, viewers pick the shark. Um, unless there's some rare, like, I don't think I've, I've picked the shark maybe once or twice, uh, but for the most part, viewers pick the shark. Um, you know, and it's got to be a new new species that we haven't done before. So, uh, feel free to throw out multiple options. Um, I really like. I, I, I am liking shallow water environments, but um, I'm I'm cool with anything. So. And Howard, feel feel free to um, leave suggestions as well. Um, also, of course, uh, I just I just uh, since uh, uh, I, I yeah since, since Bruce is. Um, Potentially new, I just want to, um, you know, let them have the first shot as far as, you know, maybe a shark we could talk about next week, so. But, uh, let's see, as far as biofluorescence, doo -doo 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 -doo. I'm just kind of scanning the rest of this. To make a difference in my future with the career oh no the music sorry about that sorry let me go back to donut country because that was actually really pleasant i've never played this game but uh the soundtrack is actually awesome so sorry about that it switched to an ad so i just wanted to go back to music anyway about biofluorescent evolution I'm still kind of more focused on the function oh hey uh, I think this is kind of related to what Bruce was saying in both species fluorescent materials arranged in distinct patterns are located solely on the dermis in swell sharks, these patterns appear to be sexually dimorphic, with females having a unique face mask and more dense ventral spotting than extends further interiorly than in males. In addition, the pelvic claspers of males, which are lacking in females, are strongly fluorescent in both uh, the swell shark and the chain cat shark. Uh, sexual dimorphism in the dermal denticles has also been previously reported for the lesser spotted cat shark. Very cool. So I think you might be right, Bruce. This is super cool. The fact that these critically patterned biofluorescent sharks and rays are capable of visualizing neurofluorescence. 
Um, suggests of the communication species recognition role. This is super cool. So it, there, there's definitely a lot of... Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that this might be helpful for them finding a mate. That's so cool. Uh, Biofluorescence could also potentially help camouflage cat sharks against potential pe predators w who do have color vision. Although very little is known regarding the predators of cat sharks, and the visual systems of only a few marine organisms have been studied in detail. It is now known that many elastobranchs possess well-developed eyes, as well as, as well as a large sensory brain dedicated to processing visual information. Cat sharks possess the ability to detect green biofluorescence as emitted by their conspecifics, and this fluorescence creates greater contrast in the surrounding habitat in deeper blue shifted waters. Okay, very cool. So I think that's enough of that, because I think the rest is kind of more like the methods, but I think we kind of got the gist of it, where um, basically like the deeper you go, it doesn't really matter as much, because the biofluorescence helps with contrast. So what's kind of cool for me um, is that like I, I work a lot with um, just like uh, I, like throughout the entirety of Dr. Jaws I worked a lot with like um, just like it's I don't have Photoshop I have Picasso but I, I've worked a lot with like digital images and like kind of image manipulation and like for me personally this is kind of a weird analog but like I have to play with like the brightness and contrast a lot as far as like trying to get that right look and trying to kind of make things pop more. And it's really cool that there's a like like there's something similar to that going on as far as like biofluorescence and being able to see sharks in this different wavelength of light um, might help as far as recognition in deeper ocean environments or you know just normal ocean environments where it's like you know color is filtered out like white light is filtered out um, if you're if you're a shark who can perceive on this biofluorescent spectrum you're able to see the contrast more clearly. It's super cool. That, 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 that's pretty amazing, honestly. So, Oh, hey, Howard. Uh, zebra shark. I think we have not, actually. Let me make sure. I'm really glad. I'm actually very happy that um, these have been... I started organizing these into, like, different playlists, and that's actually turned out to be extremely helpful as far as... Um, checking up on like what we've done and haven't done but uh yeah we have not done the zebra shark so let's go for it so uh that is i think that's stegostoma fasciatum let's pull that up because i am definitely down for that um oh there's different kinds of zebra wait a minute Oh, this is cool. Okay. Okay, so I just pulled open Sharks of the World. Okay. So I just pulled open Sharks of the World and we found I, the zebra shark is there. And I'm pretty sure I didn't hallucinate this. I'm pretty sure this always was called Stegosoma fasciatum, was the scientific name for zebra sharks. I'm pretty sure that was the thing. But in Sharks of the World, and I have the most recent edition uh, from 2021, um, the name is Stegostoma tigrinum. So I, I wonder if that's a name change. And it could be, because this, like, a lot has happened um, in the past, like, 10 years, uh, 20 years even, but like 10 years. Like, tiger sharks have been completely relocated to their new, uh, their own family. Um, the sand tiger shark, same thing. Um, so I wonder if this is yet another weird taxonomic change. But let's do it. Let's go for it. Uh, now I'm, like, actually extremely intrigued by that, uh, as far as, um, is this another... Uh, taxonomy or classification uh, redo I guess so yeah so next week we're definitely gonna do the zebra shark uh, good good call and really good pick so that's that's actually really 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 good choice so um, yeah I'm curious why the name is that it's like it's like the Berenstein Bears effect <laughs> like um, I don't know if you, if you ever heard of if you guys ever heard of that but like um, 
it's that whole like it's like one of those weird things where it's um a lot of people like misremember like how you spell Berenstein Bears and there's this whole conspiracy theory that's like oh like we all came from a parallel universe where Berenstein Bears was spelled with like the I before the E but in reality it was the E before the I I don't know it's a weird thing anyway I'm having that moment with Steg Stegosoma Fasciatum but uh let's see we have got a couple minutes left I just want to check out I think just in a biofluorescent theme, I'll just briefly check out these really cool figures, and then I think we'll wrap it up for a night since we're almost at 11. Bright green biofluorescence and sharks derives from bromokinurinine metabolism. So I am not a big protein guy, so I we won't uh, dive too much into that. But uh, it's really cool to see these visuals on. Um, fluorescence in the swell shark and actually this is kind of cool this is uh the bottom picture is a different species it's a chain cat shark but um it's kind of cool to see this bright field image where you see a bit of reflection on the dermal denticles right here and then the fluorescent image you actually see this bright green and they it, like like it's cool to see how this lines up with this unique pattern on the denticles so very interesting Oh, okay. Figures D through F are the swell shark and comparisons of biofluorescent patterns in the swell shark. So I just want to zoom in on this image. Man, this is really wild. So so these are like zoom, uh, zoomed Im images. So um, here's the closest one. Like you see these raised dermal denticles. And we talked about earlier how like these dermal denticles are specifically like really kind of thorny and um, uniquely raised. And that might be helpful for it like lodging into crevices as it swells up. Um, here is a zoomed out version um, where you can actually see like the dark spots and the dark spots are still dark in the biofluorescence. And then here is like the actual shark. White light versus biofluorescent light. And actually this is, oh here we go. Yeah, this is my last comment on biofluorescence, but like, actually check this out. Like this is exactly what I think the function is. It's like, if you look at the right side of the photo, the tail is further away from the white light camera. So it looks darker, right? If you look at the top photo, it's the same distance, like the shark is the same distance, but you can clearly see that the tail is actually a lot more reflective and a lot more contrasting under this different wavelength. So this is actually literally like a, a living example of like, oh, this is like the deeper you go, like the darker you go, you can still see biofluorescence. Like if you're if you're a shark who is able to kind of perceive biofluorescent light, you can still see your, your shark buddy no matter how dark it is. Whereas like if you're a human being who can see white light, like in this bottom photo, like the tail looks really shadowy, um, you know, so it's it's less distinct. That's really cool. So, awesome, awesome, awesome. Hey, Sir Douglas Bane, welcome back. The Mandela Effect, that's a better way to describe the this zebra shark phenomenon. So, um, we're just wrapping up on swell sharks, but this is super cool. We were just talking about um, you know, just kind of how, like, basically the gist of the biofluorescence thing is that um, this this is one of very few shark species that can actually emit, or not emit, but like, well, I guess emit, like, like that basically has biofluorescence, so it glows um, green under a certain light condition, like, like, under a specific wavelength of light, and the idea is this helps it stand out for other sharks to find it, or um, maybe to kind of help it camouflage um, like, and it doesn't matter how deep you go, like no matter how deep the water is and no matter how much light is absorbed in the surface, you can still see the contrasting, um, green pattern on this species under a biofluorescent wavelength uh, of light. It's really, really cool. So, but, um, yeah, let's, uh, oh, I really zoomed in on that video. Um, let's wrap up with a couple clips and... Um, call it a night as far as swell sharks go, but um, 
Oh, hey, awesome. Sorry, sorry about that. I, I was here for a while, but just didn't comment. Sorry about that. So, well, glad to have you back. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't know if you're here for the top of the stream, but uh, this particular episode, this is a year. Uh, this is, this is um, literally like uh, a little over a year ago, uh, I, this streaming project started. Uh, so with the bull shark. So um, so episode one was the bull shark on November seventh last year, and then episode forty nine is on the swell shark uh, uh, November thirteenth of this year. So it's been a really really cool year, um, and we're gonna do a holiday special in December uh, with a special surprise guest. Uh, so we'll do another d uh, guest stream, kind of celebrating and reminiscing, um, kind of about our community and like all the cool stuff that we did this year. Uh, it's been super, super fun, and I definitely learned a lot, like a lot more than I was really expecting. Um, you know, it's been super, super fun, and this has been a really, really great community. Um, you know, lots of great shark talk, lots of fossils, lots of art. Like, it's been super cool. Um, oh, hey, Bruce. Yeah, good to see four of us here. Hopefully this channel continues to grow. Thank you. Like, I, I, I think I feel really good about it. Um, the nice thing is, even though this is like... So I classify this channel as like a microscopic channel, honestly. But even even so, like uh, since I can kind of see the back end of YouTube on, on my end, like it's definitely grown a lot. The rate of growth is a lot faster ever since this like stream project started. So like, um, yeah, even though it's like tiny now, I do think it's actually going to keep growing, and the growth rate has definitely been increasing much faster. Um, and it's just like, it's really cool. And honestly, I'm just like honored and flattered um and i'm just really happy to share the space with everybody uh because like you know this has been a really fun interactive community everybody here is like really passionate about shark science and everybody has like contributed a lot as far as like you know new knowledge and just cool ideas and you know frankly i've been schooled on the paleontology side especially so uh which i love i mean you know we've we've just kind of heard a lot of things together and there's actually like a lot more information on sharks out here now than there was you know like even 10 years ago or five years ago like there's a lot of resources out there but i kind of feel like with all the noise of like the internet and just kind of the information environment it's kind of hard to find some of these resources and it's hard to find some of this information so um i feel like this is a really great platform uh and a really great community to kind of like trade resources and share and just kind of like talk about sharks in a, in a way that's like truly biodiverse like we're going over a lot of different species a lot of different parts of the world a lot of different habitats and we've learned a lot and we've given a lot of species across the entirety of sharkdom a fair shake um that don't that they don't really get in popular media so i really love this experiment it's been super fun it's not really an experiment anymore it's it's a solid community so but you guys are the best and i'm really glad that we had a fun like we we had a, like a stream of like multiple multiple people were here tonight and it's super fun commentary so thank you so much for watching uh next week we're gonna do the zebra shark and we're gonna figure out what in the world this whole stegostoma t what is it tigrinum this whole name change is about um because i wonder if this is yet another taxonomic revision so i'm really excited about that for next week but I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Uh, next week is, I guess, going to be sort of like a Thanksgiving stream almost. So, like, you know, it's a holiday season. Uh, I know Canada already had Thanksgiving. Uh, it's American Thanksgiving next Thursday. So, but either way, I hope you guys have some good food and some good times, good movies this week. And I'll see you next week. But thank you so much for this awesome year. Uh, we'll celebrate more on our holiday stream. And, uh, yeah. Oh, and no more ads. That's another tradition that I always have on these streams is the ads. But anyway, have a good night, guys. Take care. See you soon.